Well, obviously, I do love the the power of words to create a feeling or to evoke a meaning. But I also think what I love about telling stories is teaching. So, you know, my book, Seven Days in May, is about, well, it's set against the backdrop of a race riot that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. And um, I, I don't think I still have finished writing about that subject because it is still, I think about it all the time. It has such a, um, had such a powerful impact on me and the idea of justice. But when I, when that book came out and I went to visit with high school students and uh, middle grade students about um, this event, most of them, even growing up in that Tulsa area had not been taught the, the real story behind what happened that ignited that race riot. And so I think the power of telling our history um, and bringing it, telling the stories of real people who lived in real places gives us a greater perspective of the depths of history and the role that can play in how we engage in our world today. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the Storytellers Network Podcast. I'm so glad you're joining me today. In this episode, we talked to a woman that I met through Twitter, back when Twitter was more than just a broadcast medium. Uh, We connected through the running community, even though at the time she lived in Oklahoma, and I'm, of course, in Michigan. That's the beauty of Twitter, though. I know her on Twitter as Jen Lewitt, uh, although it's actually Jen Lute, because uh, her name is Jennifer Lutweiler. And she is a writer, and her book, Run With Me, and the blogging she did back then inspired my wife, Sonia, and me, and we became better acquaintances through social media. So it's very cool there. So as a blogger, a writer, an author of two books, and a social media storyteller all in one, Jen shares her story with the Storytellers Network, her craft, her successes and trials, All of that is coming up next. But before we get into today's conversation, a quick reminder to find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for all the episodes, for how to contact us, and for other resources to help you tell your story. And if you like what we're doing here, please leave us a review. It helps us reach new storytellers. Thank you to Podcast Pilot and Casterly for supporting this movement. If you want experts on the podcast world, like how to start your own show, talk to the teams headed up by the amazing Jamie J and Sarah Parrish. Now, let's get to the stories. So thanks, Jen, for joining the Storytellers Network. Uh, As I introduced you earlier, a a writer, a blogger, an author, published author. You, to me, are definitely a storyteller. So thank you for being here with me today. Thanks for having me, Dan. So I like to uh, start off the interviews with, or the conversations, uh, with uh, the idea the storytellers can be anywhere in the world. You know, if you think about ballet, you need to be in New York. You think about movies, you need to be in Hollywood. Think about other, other, you know, industries, you need finance, you need to be in New York, you know, on Wall Street. But for storytellers, we can be anywhere. So tell the listeners, Jen, where you are geographically. Uh, right now, geographically, I am in Rome, Georgia, which is in the northwest corner of the state, about an hour and a half northwest of Atlanta. Okay. Uh, you don't sound like a Southern Belle, so I'm, I'm going to guess. <laughs> of course, I know the answer, but I'm going to say it this way. I'm going <laughs> to guess you're not from there. I am not from here. Uh, we moved here two years ago from Oklahoma, and I'm not from there either. <laughs> I was born and raised, well, raised in Pennsylvania, in okay. Pittsburgh. So uh, we've never had, I don't have Southern accent. My kids don't have Southern accent. And that was actually one of the hardest things for us to get used to here. We're still kind of getting used to the yes, ma'am, no, ma'am thing, which we did not have in Oklahoma. And it's very big here. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. is not a, uh, not a thing I grew up 
saying to my parents, uh, but where we live is very uh, required. Well, cool. So, so, so Georgia is a great place for a storyteller to be. So that's good. Mm -hmm. Do you consider yourself a storyteller? Is that how you define yourself in part? I do use that as a descriptor for myself. Yes. Um, there are days when it feels like a lie. And I think probably most storytellers would say the same thing. Day, days when I don't really feel like I'm doing what I say I do. But yeah, I do use that term. And where does your story as that storyteller begin? That is a really good question. And I think it, it comes from my family of origin. Both my parents are storytellers, even though my mom didn't get paid to be a storyteller. I, I think my favorite stories are stories my parents told about their own upbringing. But my dad was a pastor and his sermons were always story heavy. So um, I feel like I grew up in a home where books were really important and stories were really important. And so my, I feel like my parents used story to prove points, to entertain, to pass the time. And it's now the way I learn best is through stories. And the way I relate to people is usually through story. So I, so to answer your question, I think my storytelling life began when I was born and born into a, a home where people appreciated the spoken word and words were never, we were never at a loss for words at our house growing up. <laughs> those, those storyteller pastors are, are the best. I, I enjoy they, that. Kind they of, really are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Jen, when did you realize that you had that gift and wanted to use it in some way in the world? Um, in high school, I, I felt like I definitely want to pursue my life as a writer now. I have chosen to, I have chosen to and been on a winding path to that. Mm -hmm. But I think in high school, I really started to explore. I was always interested in the way sentences crafted in a particular way could create meaning or evoke feeling and um, whenever I hear someone do that really well, I think, Ooh, I want to do that too. And I think that was probably part of my growing up is that reading a lot of books and being mesmerized by the power of story, you know, that's when I realized I wanted to do that when I grew up. And do you think that power of story transcends, uh, the, the different kinds of story? And when, when I hear you talk, I think of books. I think of when I read why I or um, run with me, why I run is your blog. I read that too. But um, when mm -hmm. I read, you know, run with me, I think of, of, of books, but I like the idea too. And as I'm interviewing other storytellers, I keep thinking about other ways to tell stories. What about song lyrics or poetry? Did you dabble with that too? <laughs> That's a funny question. I actually did. Although not to any, you know, like, actual success or anything, but I remember I had friends who were in a band in high school and I dabbled in, um, writing lyrics, but, but more, um, more than, um, writing them, experiencing them. And I've talked to my own kids about the different music they listen to and what they hear in those songs. And, um, actually in sixth grade, we had a teacher who said for this project, you can bring in, um, a record. They were 78 when I went to school. We, we were able to bring in a record of a favorite song and all the lyrics. And we were to talk about what that song was about. And of course, maybe it was about love or whatever, but there's simile and there's an, a story arc and there are characters and there's conflict and all of those things. And when in sixth grade, that was such a powerful lesson to me that lyrics weren't just there to like fill the time between like make noise between the music, mm -hmm. but that they, you know, they were just as much a part of the story as the, the, the music was the song, the, you know, instruments. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I actually do think lyric uh, stories can be told in a lot of different ways. Even in the work I do now, I work with students who have learning like 
ADHD or other diagnoses, and I help them to organize their time and do executive function kinds of things. And a lot of the times, the way I get through to them the most effectively is through story. And me and my colleagues will often tell stories about our own academic success or failures. And and that is more engaging to them than any lecture about you got to do your homework and you've got to get this turned in and your junior year is important and blah, blah, blah. Nobody listens to that. People listen to, well, tell, tell me why, you know, give me a reason. Show me, show me why that worked for someone else. And I'm more willing to listen to you. So even in, even in that day to day stuff, I feel like story plays a bigger role than, than we realize or that we would acknowledge. Yeah. So that connection has to be great, obviously, but what else do you love about telling stories in whatever medium that you're in? Well, obviously, I do love the the power of words to create a feeling or to evoke a meaning. But I also think what I love about telling stories is teaching. So, you know, my book, Seven Days in May, is about, um, well, it's set against the backdrop of a race riot that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. And I, I don't think I still have finished writing about that subject because it is still, I think about it all the time. It has such a, um, had such a powerful impact on me and the idea of justice. But when I, when that book came out and I went to visit with high school students and uh, middle grade students about this event, most of them, even growing up in that Tulsa area had not been taught the, the real story behind what happened that ignited that race riot. And so I think the power of telling our history um, and bringing it, telling the stories of real people who lived in real places gives us a greater perspective of the depths of history and the role that can play in how we engage in our world today. So if I know that that there was injustice in 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but now I live in Rome, Georgia, at a in a very different community in a very different set of circumstances, but I can still see injustice in a different way and maybe make choices or advocate in ways that I wouldn't have if I didn't know that story. Yeah. Is that answering your question? So <laughs> basically, I'm saying what I love about storytelling is the the power it has to illuminate the past. So right. I'm very interested in how and how we can communicate true historic events in ways that are compelling. Yeah, illuminate the past. That's good. Yeah. yeah that's a great a great reason to tell stories, not just to mm-hmm. I mean entertainment's great, but um, right. but yeah, illuminate the past. That's good. Now mm-hmm. on the other side of that, that's what you love about it. What's what's a challenging part of storytelling that you run into as a writer and an author? Well, I'll tell you, in all honesty, the hardest thing is being confronted every day with uh, stories that are so well told that it makes you feel like, well, I just shouldn't even bother. I've just (laughs) finished writing, uh, reading two um, really great novels by two wonderful women of color. And um, you, you read it and you just think, well, I mean... I'm never going to be able to do that. So I'll just quit. (laughs) So for sure that, you know, that's the ego part, the insecurity part of it. Um, And then of course, what everyone always says is I just don't have the time, but of course we have the time. We may not be writing it down. We may not be publishing it, but if, if that's a mode of communication that works for you and speaks to you, then you're always going to be doing it, whether it's a formal you know, quote unquote system or not. But yeah, I mean, I think really it's, it's insecurity and ego. Yeah. So I'm not the only one yeah. that thinks that when I read something really good and think, Oh, I'm just done. God, just, I can't do this. This is so amazing. Yeah. That's good to know. So I like the idea. I like the idea that unlike things, sometimes tie together. So maybe I'm totally off base here, but do you find any kind of connection between running and writing? Do you have like, you know, does that, does that connect at all? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're very, very similar in terms of like, (laughs) 
I had a friend once who said like running is its own metaphor. And I think that's definitely true. And he also said, you get out of it what you put in, into it. And I think the same is true for, for writing or storytelling. Um, there's only one way to get good at it. And that's to do a lot of it mm-hmm. every, every day, whether you feel like it or not, you get up and you, and you do it. However, however, whatever that looks like, you get up and you do it. And some days are, you know, some runs are junk and you feel like your legs are made out of lead. And some days you make sentences that you, you know, like a toddler would not bother to claim because they're so bad. <laughs> so, you know, I definitely feel like there, and then there are other runs where you feel like I just totally kicked butt on that. And, and just at the same time, like there's a, there are a couple sentences in my first book that I am still like, can't believe I managed to write because I feel like they were so, um, they so completely captured what I wanted to say. Of course, those seem more fleeting than the, the, the sucky runs or the sucky days writing. But, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you have to do it to get good at it. Some days are better than others. And, um, and, what I tell people who say, how do you have the time is we all have 24 hours in a day. We all find time for things that matter. So if you're not doing it, it doesn't, it, it's not enough of a priority for you to carve out time. And that's okay. That's not an indictment. That's just, that's just not where you are right now. Maybe you will be tomorrow or next week, but you know, we, um, that's the reality. We all have this amount of time. We fill it with things we choose to fill it with. Yeah. Do you see a difference yeah. between storytelling? Do, do you differentiate in your mind storytelling and writing? Do you story, does everything become storytelling and only writing is only writing? Mm, that's <clears throat> a good question. Uh, yeah, I think I do differentiate them, but I think when I think of storytelling in like I internally think, Oh, that means writing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, that's just a like a knee jerk reaction. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was thinking is that because I was going to ask about how writing has impacted your speaking when you said earlier uh, about seven days in May and how that mm-hmm. got you to speak in front of students. I was thinking, you know, it is a little bit different. It's when we tell a story orally, it's different from when we sit down to write. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. And oh, absolutely. And my dad and my sister and one of my daughters, they're all really good at spoken storytelling they they draw you in they have good mannerisms they create drama you're hanging off their words you laugh in the right places I don't feel like I can do that I feel like I can pace my stories better when I write them down and uh, maybe that's because I I tend to word spew when I talk I just start talking until I have the thought formulated whereas if I'm writing it down you know, of course you, you have that space and time to edit because no one will see it until you've decided that someone can see it. So, um, so maybe I just haven't spent time on that verbal part of it, but I also think those people tend to like that, um, forum better than I do. I can do it. I just enjoy the writing part of it better. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as a writer, does Jen Lutweiler have an inspiration? Do you have a muse? Mm, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. Do you um, have Do you have a specific thing that you do to write to get into that mindset? Maybe. Uh, no, I don't, but I will tell you, I definitely have things that like are monsters that keep me from it. Mm. Um, because I do think like you, can, you can't wait for the muse to show up. You have to, if you're going to do it, you just do it. Just like praying when you don't feel like praying or running when you don't feel like running, you write when you don't feel like writing. But I do think, um, and you know this, I've, and I've been very open about it. I've, I've wrestled with depression my whole life and there are times when it, it simply makes it impossible or more painful to approach the page. And I find myself actively avoiding it, finding, like I said, I have 24 hours in every day. I will fill that 24 hours up with, you know, I would rather clean the bathroom with a toothbrush than sit down and write um, because it is so, because for me, writing is a 
therapy as well. And so that, um, you know, if there, if there's something I'm not quite ready to tackle, I'm, I'm going to avoid that page for as long as possible. <laughs> yeah. that, so instead of inspiration, I have the opposite of like, uh, obstacles to fight before I get to the desk. Yeah. Have you, have you always used writing as therapy? I have, but have you? Yeah. 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 My whole life. Yep. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. I can, I can, I can go back in my mind to maybe middle school, definitely high school. The, the, the quote poetry I used to write, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, love I was telling my daughter about that the other day. I hope my, my parents moved out of the home I grew up in that they just put all that in the fire and just <laughs> walked away from it. We Nobody <laughs> needs to see that ever again. Yeah, <laughs> it's totally. bad. Um, how do you think media affects our storytelling nowadays? I think people are doing really cool things with media. There are some um, storytelling podcasts that are just, fantastic. I love what people are doing with, I don't really do a lot of video. I don't watch a lot of, um, like videos on, on social media, but I definitely feel like there are some good things out there. That's not a thing I'm super interested in, but podcasts and storytelling, um, audit audio books. There's some really great things people are doing with music and, um, narration choices that I've really enjoyed. It's I haven't personally created any of it, um, but I have seen some really great things. I And I'm not one of those people who worries that the book will die, you know, or that paper books are dead. I think um, we are evolving and we are adding and subtracting. And if I can see if... If what, if what you're adding to, let's say, a, um, a podcast that's a story, you know, like maybe it's serialized, if what you're adding to it with um, different voice actors and music and sound effects has a purpose and I can see that purpose and it supports the story, I'm fine with that. I, and I don't, I, I think there's lots of ways to tell a story and I think people are doing some really interesting things now. Yeah. Do you, do you see it as yeah. almost a return to the old days of radio with some of the different it's, podcasts out there? Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? We're listening to some really, um, you know, like every week you have to turn, tune in to find out what happened next. <laughs> and, um, so every, there's nothing new under the sun, right? All right. Uh, so I'm gonna put you mm-hmm. on the spot. What's, uh, what's one of your favorite storytelling podcasts out there? Cause I like to add to my library too. <laughs> um, homecoming was one i totally binged, which was amazing. I didn't finish the second season because I, I was waiting for it to all, like, I want it all at once. I don't want to wait for it. So <laughs> I wait until it's all out. And then I, um, so that is one. And then there's one called American History Tellers, which I alluded to earlier, my interest in American history. And this one, it just wrapped up like a six week series on the cold war and they used, they did a really interesting way. So they were telling facts about, you know, how the cold war happened and sort of sub stories that we American people didn't maybe know about at the time, but they, they kind of put you in different um, hypothetical characters. Imagine you're a home worker in St. Louis in 1959 and he, he would paint this picture of, here's why you're participating in this study or whatever. And it was really fascinating. Hmm. Really good. Cool. Uh, so I, I just discovered not too long ago, uh, the way I heard it from Mike Rowe. Okay. You know, he's the, he's of course, dirty jobs, Mike Rowe narrator. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's like a five minute podcast and it goes back a year and a half maybe, but okay. it's, it's, it's reminiscent of Paul Harvey's the way, uh, the, uh, the rest of the story. It's just, oh, okay. it, it's that short story of here's a little bit of information, blah, blah, blah. And then you get the hook at the end of, oh, that's who that was. So I think that's such a cool way to do it too. But, oh, that's very cool. And, and you don't have to invest a whole bunch of time in it either. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'll have to look that up. Yeah. I, just, I love geeking out about podcasts now. I'm, I'm hooked. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, I, I'm trying to get, um, you know, we live at this school and I'm, I was asking the media lady if they were thinking about doing that. There's going to be some build up for that. It's going to take a little bit of time, but I, I absolutely see that as a growing um, area. Mm. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So what's your, if you had, if you had to pick one story or a style or something, what's your favorite story? 
Okay. So I have a two part answer just to be complicated. (laughs) Um, so my favorite novel ever is Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. And it's not because it's a romance. It's because her social satire is just so biting and hilarious. I, I just find it absolutely cunning and delightful, Hmm. but alternatively there, my, you know, I go, go back to my parents, my, Mom told a story about um, <laughs> about um, throwing a rock at a boy who was teasing her brother. And I just the way she tells this, you know, back when they were kids, you know, in the 50s or whatever. And just the way my mom tells the story um, is a way it, it's just, it just makes it my favorite story. And also my, you know, all my dad's stories. He's just full of them. So I would say like my parents, my parents' stories about their lives mm-hmm. and Pride and Prejudice. Two mm-hmm. totally different genres. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's, but that's the beauty of story, right? Right. <clears throat> how, how are you supposed to get your stories out there today? You know, whether, whether it's a, a book that you've published or, or had published, um, what's a couple of things that, that storytellers can do to get those stories out there today? Yeah, that is a great question because there is so much noise. And there is, there are so many things that have been published. And I, I think there's, there's a reader for every story. I mean, just like there's a magazine for every interest. So you, it just takes so much work now because we don't, on the one hand, we don't have the gatekeepers anymore of, you know, the big publishing companies deciding who can read what and when, which we still have them, but we also have this social media thing where you can get into anybody's home pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, but at the same time, you have to sort through all that clutter. Your voice has to be distinct to get through. So, I mean, I really think it has to do with relationships locally and online, which I do think have value and should be, um, should not be relegated to some, you know, that's an online friendship. That's not you know how we tend to dis- discount that sometimes yeah. like, well, you know, you don't really know that person They're on Twitter or whatever, but that's irrelevant. If you have the same interest, you may be in a different place, but they can still um, respond to your words in, in real ways. So all, all that to say, you know, making relationships locally, regionally and online. And I mean, I don't know. It's, hard. It's hard to cut through the noise. And it feels like when you're, when you're actively trying to get your story out there, let's say you're trying to use social media to do it, you have to curate your, your feed so carefully so that it's totally targeted, that it can come to feel disingenuous or overwrought, Mm -hmm. which is not something I ever want to do. I'd rather be authentic and get, get a reader who's interested rather than you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Be a trend. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really know if I have a good, you just keep pushing it out there and, um, sharing it and, and honing. Yeah. Well, and, and what I heard you say there was a, something that I haven't heard yet is, uh, networking. Yeah. Right. I you mean, know, like, yeah. Right. And that that can be hard, especially for a storyteller who's chosen medium is, the written word because we tend to prefer to sit at our desks in our homes in, Mm -hmm. you know, by ourselves. And so you have like when that, when seven days in May came out and it it was really targeted towards that Tulsa area, I had to swallow my pride and, you know, learn how to make phone calls and, and ask people for introductions. Hey, you might be interested in learning about this, reaching out to the history center and the history teachers and social studies teachers. And, um, uh, just, yeah, I mean, networking and not being afraid to, to ask what I would tell myself before every phone call is the worst I can do is say no. And I'm nowhere that puts me in no better. I'm no worse off than I was before the phone call. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So that I, I just tell myself, you know, what, what happens is if I get a no, is I get a no. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean I'm a failure. It doesn't mean I stink. It doesn't mean my book is awful. And those things may all be true, but that <laughs> might, that's not <laughs> true because of the no. Yeah. That's so hard. Right. So we yeah. have to be willing to hear that. We have to be willing to, to make the ask. 
So for sure. Network and don't be afraid of the no. I like those. Um, yep. Now you mentioned Twitter. Uh, so as I said in my intro, uh, that's where we met was through Twitter and through yeah. running and everything. Um, how do you think that social media in general affects the greater craft uh, of storytelling? Twitter has become my go-to social media right now because it, it can be so I can, I only have to see the things I want to see, mm. which, which I like. And I am forced to communicate what I need to communicate in a certain amount of time frame. Now I know people are doing all these threaded tweets and all that nonsense. And, and I, and I get that. I see the value in it, but I really appreciate the, the, Two, what is it? Two eighty now. Yeah, yeah. Characters. I really appreciate, and I actually really liked one hundred and forty. I liked mm-hmm. having to really condense my thought down to the essence of its meaning, mm-hmm. and to get that out. And so I think, for if not for any other reason, if not for any other um, end game, it's great practice at saying what exactly what you mean to say. Yeah. Um, you know, because in a in an essay or a blog post or an article, you've got so much time to to fill in the gaps and edit and you know carefully create your your point. But on Twitter, you've got to you know if you're going to use it and you want to be effective, you've got to really know what you mean to say. Yeah, and standing out like that is important because it teaches you. Uh, it, it it brings out what is unique about you and your story or that particular story. And, and it, right. I think it helps you hone that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, it is good for networking. It's great for um, making contact with people who might have information you're seeking. Like right now I'm, I'm thinking about setting a book in my hometown of Pittsburgh and there's so much, I haven't lived there in so long that I have to go back and remember now, where was that store located and what street was it on? And, um, I can do that on Twitter with the, the audience, that, which I hate to use that word, but that my group of people that I have on there. Mm-hmm. So it's great for just finding information. Yeah, absolutely. I I am still, yeah. I've been on Twitter since 2008 and I know people say mm-hmm. it's dead or dying and I even make fun of it a little bit, you know, it said yeah. in my intro, it's when it, back when it was more than just a broadcast thing. Um, That's right. But it still is. Yeah, it still is that connection, that networking. I could not have everybody's yeah. number to call them, but I can tweet at them. So. Yep. It's amazing. And you could, it really is sort of an egalitarian place, you know, where everybody's, what whatever you choose to put out there, you put out there, but everybody's coming at the same with the same tools on the same playing field. Mm. So it does kind of even things out a little bit. Yeah, it does. Which yeah. is cool. Yeah. Um so for someone who has three published books, who has a, a blog that's been uh, pretty popular, a, a good sized audience on, on social media or network or mm. tribe, I would see you as someone who has kind of made it in a sense, depending on your definition, but, yeah. but you know, d- did you ever look around at some point in the last few years here and say, boy, I've kind of made it as a writer. And again, not that that like stops your progress, yeah. but, but you know, has that, has that come for you yet? Um, I think after I released my novel, um, I did feel like, okay, that is what, that was my dream. That was my goal. I finished it, but it's funny how short that lasts right? <laughs> we, we tend to remember and, and dwell on the negatives longer than we dwell on the positives. And yes, that is still like, I will always have that, but I, but I have found that I've rested. I haven't produced any new book in a couple years. And, um, and in the intervening time, that has totally worn off. So I do not have, I do not have that same. And and honestly, I would pull those books back and recraft them. But now if I had the chance, I would pull them back and and redo them totally. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good lesson too, in that you need to stand by, you need to be able to stand by your stories even after the passage of time, which those stories are still relevant. You know, my, that first one is more of a, like a memoir kind of thing. And 
it's actually only two books running the running and seven days in May. But, um, I remember those the seven days of May and, and run with me. But then as I was doing my research earlier, I found another one credited to you. So, uh, oh, practice I'm, of love. That's funny. Cause I, Oh, I'm in there. I'm in a couple of, um, what are those called? Anthologies. I'm gotcha. in a couple of anthologies. Okay. So yes, I am in that one. I'm in a couple others. That's funny that my name came up on that one. Yeah. I mean, that's fine. But, um, I would, I would change all of them because when you, as you grow as a person and as you mature, you think, oh my, like, just like that high school poetry, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't believe I ever wrote that. And so there's a part of me that feels that way about both of those books. But at the same time, I think, no way, man, I'm proud of that. I did that. Very few people do that. It's the same as a marathon. I'm never going to win a marathon. I'm never going to win a Pulitzer for my writing, but, um, you know, I'm going to finish that race and I'm going to do, I'm going to write these words. They may not ever get me anywhere fancy, but they're going to be what I want them to be. Mm -hmm. So, um, so as a published author, how, what was a little bit of your journey to get to that point for anybody listening who, you know, has that idea of, I I, I want to be a published writer. I want to do this thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to run that race. How did you get here? where you have a couple of books published and you're, and you're being interviewed, uh, as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it was a lot of time spent in my chair at my desk, writing, writing, writing. I mean, it was, I didn't publish my first book until I was almost 40. Um, I had been writing and freelance editing and working and publishing pretty much my whole life, but it was always behind the scenes. And so nothing was really credited to me. Um, and so how did I get here? I mean, I, it was just a, a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of energy writing all the time. Um, and, and finally being willing, like with my running book, I feel like I really, I approached a lot of issues that I had been trying not to like with depression and other things that happened in my youth. And, um, I know a lot of other people have tackled that also in their writing and, and you and I talked about how writing is therapeutic, but it's only therapeutic if you're willing to write down or speak the thoughts, you know, it, you, they're, they're not going to do you any good just rolling around in your head. And so for me, it was being willing to write down on the page you know, these things happen to me as a young person and that is my, that is part of my truth and it hurts and I wish that wasn't the case, but that's where it is. And so it's, I guess it's a humbling and a humility of, of, and being willing to understand that not everybody's going to like my writing and not everyone's going to like me and that's okay. I have to be okay with that. That's that's hard to be okay with, though, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because you, if, if you're like me, I'm a classic middle child, so I'm a pleaser. So I want people to, I want people to be okay. I want everybody to be all right. I don't want there to be conflict, and I want you to respond positively to me. But you have to have a thick skin and to be able to say, well, you know what? That's okay. You didn't like you didn't like my book. That's fine. And I recognize, you know, there are. It is not a perfect. They are not perfect books. I. I'm the first one to say there are changes I would make. There are things I would do differently. So, you know, to, as people who want to pursue publishing, I mean, you have to write, you have to know people, you have to be willing to, um, be rejected. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all the same stuff that everybody tells you, you know, there's no, sh it's like dieting. There's no shortcut. You just have to quickly include your face, <laughs> you know? So if you want to be a writer, you have to, you have to write. And that's just, you know, and you have to take rejection and you have to try again and you have to approach the page ready to, ready to learn. One of the things I'm still thinking about is, um, how, when we tell stories, the things we don't say can be just as powerful as the things we do say, the details we choose to leave out or to, or the messages we are not sure we're communicating or, or don't realize we're communicating. Like my mom, when my mom reads my work, I know she hears things about me that I don't know I'm revealing. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I don't know if other people, if when other people read it, they think the same thing, but I'm a hundred percent sure when my mom reads any of my, you know, personal essays, she, she sees more into me than what I realize she is doing. Well, and obviously there's that, that relationship there, but also I think just as, as a reader, I, I love to read. So as a reader, I put my own experiences into it and fill in the blank. And that's one of the things that I love about poetry, you know, yeah. is you can debate what, what does that flower represent or what does this darkness mean or whatever. And so right. that's what I love about story too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that is great. And I love when I hear authors interviewed and when, you know, people will ask them, well, did you mean to put that in there? Well, yes, of course the author meant to put it in there. Now you, you can, you can take out of it what you take out of it. It's like, a, a, you know, experiencing a painting. You might notice the color of the blue. I might notice the white dandelion, but they're both there on purpose. They're just each speaking to different people in different ways, which is gorgeous. I mean, that's an amazing power of story is that um, my husband always tells this story. He, he coaches and he says, when I have a group of boys after a soccer practice and I'm telling them, you guys need to do a better job of maintaining your shape and we need to use our time better and we need to whatever. When he's telling them we need to do this, this, and this, he said all, all the boys think, well, he's talking about my teammate. He's not talking about me. <laughs> and he says, when I'm talking to a group of girls and I'm saying, you need to watch our shape. We need to be faster. We need to be quicker off the ball. Take the first touch. Don't let it hit the ground. Blah, blah, blah. All those girls are thinking, well, he's talking to me and I, you know, I know I need to do a better job. The point, the point of that story, gender specific aside, is that we're all going to hear different things, no matter what the situation, given tone, time of day, how we're feeling, whether or not we need a Snickers bar, you know? <laughs> so, but that, that absolutely is part of the power of story. And when telling stories, uh, do you have a favorite platform or style? I mean, writing seems to be it, but is it personal essay, memoir type stuff? Is it the history? Is it short form novels? Do you have a favorite platform? I seem to gravitate towards um, shortish and personal essays. I do want to focus more time on novels because I think you can do so much more with them and you get more space with them. And also I read them the most. That's most of my, my consumption mm-hmm. of story is through a novel. Um, yeah, but I'd say my favorite medium is the short personal essay. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, and I like to play with them too. I like to, I, I don't always like to be serious. I like to have fun. I like to play with boys. So hmm. I try not to be the same thing all the time. Um, cause I feel like it's all practice. So oh. I want to play with different tones and stuff. Oh yeah. Um, so practice makes perfect. What are you, uh, perfecting just writing in general? <laughs> Yeah, making time, trying not yeah. to be a wiener about approaching the page. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, um, there's this story that's been in the back of my mind since I was probably in college. And I remember um, I texted my sister about it the other day. We, we used to take the bus from where we lived into downtown Pittsburgh to shop or get our haircuts or whatever. And um, on the corner of this one street on the Ohio River, there was this like triangularly shaped building set like everything in Pittsburgh is built into the mountains. So nothing is flat, you know, no house, no building is flat. Everything has like, you know, it's angular and Mm -hmm. built half of it's underground because it's built into the sides of all these mountains. And so this building is kind of stuck like right there off the river into the side of the mountain and on the side of it, it was dated at the time. And this was, you know, the eighties Tilly's beauty salon. And every time we would drive past there on the bus, I would imagine the characters in this, in this shop. And I've, that's recently just been flickering through my mind, this Tilly's beauty shop. So I'm, I'm definitely working on perfecting. I'm actually chiseling out of my brain what that kernel of a story is. So that's, I've been writing my little morning pages and trying to get the details down about 
what did I think happened in there? So mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So Jen Lutweiler, I want to, I want to ask you this, this big, tough final question that, oh, you know, that, that 60 minutes question, right? <laughs> um, yes. If, if you could only tell one last story, if that was the only, the last story you could tell, what would that look like? Mm, that is such a good story. I, I, I would tell the story of my family and I would, and the reason why is because not because I think we're extraordinary I mean, we are, but not, uh, not, we're not, um, not because I think we have an, an unusual existence, but because at the core of it, that's, that's where I am. And that's who I am. I am a wife and a mom and I'm a daughter and I'm a sister. And those roles have shaped me and shaped my kids and will shape their kids. and that story is an epic that we're still writing. Is that super cheesy? No, no, that I, <laughs> I've, I've been accused by uh, a couple of listeners of saying, I love it too much. So I didn't, I was trying to choose what words to say. Cause I, I love that. <laughs> I loved how you said that it's an epic. We're still writing. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. Good stuff. And you know, I think about it in terms of like, it's messy and it's chaotic <laughs> and it's bananas and we're all just trying to figure out what the heck is going on most of the time. But that's, that's my love. That's my story. My people. Very good. So yeah. where can, so obviously you're on Amazon. I mean, I find you there easily, uh, but mm-hmm. where can, where can people find uh, Jennifer Lutweiler? Find me on Twitter. Jen L U I T is, at Jen Lute is my handle. Same as Instagram. Um, same as Facebook. I don't spend a whole lot of time over there. Um, I do love to talk to people. I'll talk to anybody anytime. And, um, and then my website is my name, which I think you'll probably spell out. Oh, yeah. You want me to do it? No, that's okay. all right. Yeah. It'll be in the show notes for sure, but okay. all right. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time yeah. today, Jen. I, I appreciate it very much. This was, this yeah, was a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Dan. It was yeah. fun. Thanks for, those were good, challenging questions and fun stuff to think about. So thank yeah, you. Well, thanks. I hope, I hope the listeners enjoy yeah. them and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you on, on the running or the writing path. One or the other. <laughs> okay. That sounds great, Dan. Oh man, thank you so much to our guest author, Jen Lutweiler. Be sure to visit her online. As she mentioned, you can find her all over the place. And those links are in the show notes. So you can find those at uh, thestorytellersnetwork.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it all over and tag us too, would you? Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, email it to your friends, text somebody, anywhere that you can share with other storytellers is always helpful. Speaking of helpful, you can leave us a review, a written review on iTunes. Uh, We would appreciate that. A big thank you to our partners here at the Storytellers Network, Casterly and Podcast Pilot. Thanks for making the world of podcasts a better place. Jamie, Jay, and Sarah Parrish and the rest of the team, terrific people, and you will be better off knowing them. Them, trust me. Without their support, the Storytellers Network would be just a dream. Now, until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to tell. Cheers. Cheers.